Medusa's head. Greek myth retold by Olivia E. Coolidge. King Acrisos of Argos was a hard, selfish man. He hated his brother Proteus, who later drove him from his kingdom and cared nothing for his daughter, Danny. His whole heart was set on having a son who should succeed him, but since many years went by and he still only had one daughter, he sent a message to the Oracle of Apollo to ask whether he should have more children of his own. The Oracle of the Ant the answer of the oracle was terrible. Acreso should have no son, but his daughter, Danny, would bear him a grandchild who should grow up to kill him. At these words, Acrisos was beside himself with fear and rage. Swearing that Danny should never have a child to murder him, he had built a room underground and lined all through with brass. Thither he conducted Danny and shut her up, bidding her to spend the rest of her life alone. It is possible to thwart the plans of mortal men, but never of those of the gods. Zeus himself looked with pity at the unfortunate girl and has said he has descended to her through a tiny hole that gave light in her air, air to her chamber, pouring himself down to a lamp in the form of a shower of gold. When word came to the king from those who brought food and drink to his daughter that, that to his daughter was with child, Acrisos was angry and afraid. He would have liked best to murder both Danny and her infant son, but he did not dare for fear of the god's anger at so, at so hideous a crime. He made, therefore, a great chest of wood with brass, bands of brass about it. Shutting up the girl and her baby inside, he cast them into the sea, thinking that they would either drown or starve. Again, the gods came to help Danny, for they caused the planks of the chest to swell until they fitted tightly and let no water in. The chest floated for some days and was cast up at last on the island. There, Dictus, a fisherman, found it and took Danny to his brother Apollodesus, who was the king of the island. Danny was made a servant in the palace, yet she served but many years he before many years had passed, both Dictus and Apollodesus, sorry these names, guys, had fallen in love with a silent golden haired girl. She in her heart preferred Dictus, yet since his brother was king, she did not dare make to make her choice. Therefore, she, hung, she always hung over Perseus, pretending that mother love left her no room for any other, and years after year, a silent frown would crawl Polydectus' face as he saw her caress the child. So Perseus is the son. At last, Perseus became a young man, handsome and strong, beyond the common, and a leader among the youth of the island, though he was but the son of a poor servant. Then it seemed to Polydectus that if he could once... If he could once get rid of Perseus, he could force Danny to be his wife, whether she would or not. Meanwhile, in order to lure the young man's suspicions, he pretended that he would intend to marry a certain noble maiden and would collect a wedding gift for her. Now the custom was that the gift of the bridegroom to the bride was in part of his own, and in part together for marriage represents of his friends and relatives. All the young men, therefore, brought Polydictus a present, except Perseus, who was his servant's son and possesses nothing to bring. Then Polydictus said to the others, This young man owes me more than any of you, since I took him in and brought him up in my house, and yet he gives me nothing. Perseus answered in anger at the injustice of the charge. I have nothing of my own, Polydictus, yet ask me what you will, and I will fetch it, for I owe you my life. At this, Polydectus smiled, for it was what he intended, and he answered, Fetch me, in this, if this is your boast, the Gorgon's head. Now the Gorgons, who lived far off the shores, shores of the ocean, were three fearful sisters with hands of brass, wings of gold, and scales like a serpent. Two of them had scaly hens, heads and tusks like a royal boar, but the third, Medusa, had the face of a beautiful woman, with hair of writhing serpents, and so terrible was her expression that all who looked at were immediately turned to stone. This much Perseus knew of the Gorgons, but of how to find or kill them he had no idea. Nevertheless, he had given his promise, and he saw... Thought, and though he saw no now satisfaction of King Polydictus, he was bound to keep his word. In his perplexity, he, per, he prayed to the wise goddess Athene, who came to him in the vision and promised him her aid. First you must go, she said, to the sister Forseeds, who will tell you the way to the nymphs who guard the hat of darkness, the winged sandals, and the knapsack which can hold the gorgon's head. Then I will give you the shield of my brother, Hermes, a sword which shall be made of made of adamant the hardest rock for nothing else can kill the gorgons and so venomous is her blood that the mortal sword when plunged is eaten away but when you come to the gorgons invisible in your hat of darkness turn your eyes away from them and look only in the reflection of your gleaming in your gleaming shield 
thus you may kill the monster without your yourself being turned to stone pass her sisters by for they are immortal but smite off the head of medusa with the hair of wreathing snakes and put it in your knapsack and return i will be with you the vision ended and the eight, with the aid of the fiend perseus set out on a long journey to seek the four seeds the four sides where to keep going these live in a dim cavern of the far north, where nights and days are one, and where the whole earth is overspread with perpetual twilight. There sat three old women, mumbling to one another, crouched in dim heap together, for they had but one eye and one tooth between them, which passed from hand to hand. Perseus came quietly behind them, and when they fumbled for an eye, he put his strong brown hand next to one long next to one of the long yellow ones, so the old crone thought it was her sister's, and put the eye in it. There was a high scream of anger when they discovered the theft, and much clawing and groping in the dim recess of the cavern. But they were helpless in their blindness, and Perseus could laugh at them. At the length for the price of their eye, they told him how they to reach the nymphs, and Perseus, laying the eye quickly in the hand of the nearest sister, led as fast as he could before she could, she could use it. Again, it was a far journey to the garden of the nymphs, and where it was always sunshine and the trees bare golden apples. But the nymphs are friends of wise gods, and hate the monsters of darkness and the spirits of anger and despair. Therefore they receive Perseus rejoicing, and put the hat of, dark hat of darkness on his ha head, and while his feet were they were bound the golden winged sandals, which of those of Hermes, wears when he runs down the slanting sunbeams on the races along the pathways of the wind. Next, Perseus put on his back the silver sack with gleaming tassels of gold and flung across his shoulder the black sheathed sword that was a gift from Hermes. On the left arm, he fitted the shield that Athene gave, a gleaming silver shield like a mere plane without any marking. Then, when he sprang in the air and ran, invisible like the rushing wind, far out over the white capped sea, across the yellow sands of the eastern desert, over strained seams and towering mountains, until at last he came to the shores of the distant ocean, which flowed round all the world. There was a gray gorge of stone by the ocean's edge, where lay Medusa and her sister sleeping in the dim depths of the rock. All up and down the cleft of the stones took fantastic shapes of trees, beasts, birds, and serpents, or serpents. Here and there a man who had, look, had looked on the terrible Medusa stood forever with horror on his face. Far over the twilight gorge, Perseus hovered invisible, while he loosened the pale, strange sword from its black sheath. Then, with his face turning away and eyes on the silver shield, he dropped slow and silent as falling leaf, down through the rocky cleft, twisting and turning past countless strange gray shapes, down from the bright sunlight into a chill, dim shadow echoing and re-echoing with the dash of waves on the tumbled rocks beneath. There on the heap stones lay the gorgons sleeping together in the dimness, and even though he looked on them in the shield, Perseus still felt stiff with horror at the sight. Two gorgons lay sprawled together, shaped like the women yet scaled from head to foot as serpents are. Instead of hands, they had gleaming claws like eagles, and their feet were dragons' feet. Skinny metallic wings like bats hung, wings hung from their shoulders. Their faces were neither snake nor women, but part both, like the face in a nightmare. These two lay arm in arm and never stirred. Only the blue snakes still hissed and wreathed round the pale set of Medusa, as even though in the sleep lost my place, they were troubled by an evil dream. She lay there by herself, arms outstretched, face upwards, more beautiful and terrible than living than the living man may bear. All the crimes and madness of the world rushed into Perseus's mind as he gazed at the image of the in the shield. Horror stiffened in his arm, and he hovered over her with his sword uplifted. Then he shut his eyes to the vision, and into the darkness he struck. There was a great cry and a hissing. Perseus groped for the head and seized by the limp of the snaky hair. Somehow he put the knapsack uh, in his knapsack and was up and off, for the dreaded scream of the sister gorgons awakened. Now they were after him, their sharp claws grating against his silver shield. Perseus's strained forward on the pathway of the wind like a runner, and behind him the two sisters came, smelling out the prey they could not see. Snakes started from their girdles, foam flew from their tusks, and the great wings beat the air. Yet the winged sandals were even swifter than they. Perseus fled like the hunted deer with the speed of desperation. 
Presently, the horrible noise grew faint behind him, and the hissing snakes of all the sounds of the bat wings died away. At last, the gorgons could smell him no longer and returned home unavenged. By now, Perseus was over the Libyan desert, and the blood from the horrible head touched the sand. It changed to the serpents from, the, from which the snakes of Africa descended. The storm of the Libyan desert blew against Perseus in the cloud of ending sand, until not even the divine sandals could hold him from his course. Far out to the sea he was blown, and then north. Finally whirled around the heavens like a cloud of mist. He alighted in the distant west, where the giant, Atlas, held up on his shoulders the heavens from the earth. There, where the, there the weary giant, crushed under the loads of centuries, begged Perseus to show him Medusa's head. Perseus uncovered for him the dreadful thing, and Atlas was changed to the mighty mountain whose rocks reared up to the sky near the, to the gateway of the Atlantic. Sorry, guys. Perseus return, returning eastward and still battling with the wind was driven south to the land of Ethiopia where King Cephas resigned with his wife Cassiopeia. As Perseus came wheeling in, like the gull from the ocean, he saw a strange sight. Far out to the sea was troubled, seething and boiling as though stirred by a great force moving in its depths. Huge, sullen waves were starting far out and washing inland over sunken trees and flooded houses. Many miles of land were under water, and he sped over them. He saw the muddy sea lapping around the foot of a black, upstanding rock. There on the ledge above the water's edge stood a young girl chained by the arms, lips parted, eyes open, and staring face white on his linen, gar linen garment. She might have been a statue, she should, so she stood still, so still she stood, while the light breeze fluttered her dress and stirred loosened her hair. As Perseus looked at her and looked at the sea, the water began to boil again, and miles out of long, gray, scaly black of vast length lifted itself above the flood. At that, there was a shriek from a distant knoll where he could distantly see the forms of people, but the girl shrank a little and said nothing. Then Perseus, taking off the hat of darkness, alight alighted near the maiden to talk to her, and she, though nearly mad with terror, found words at last to tell him her tale. Her name was Andromeda, Andromeda and the only child of the king of the wife Cassiopeia. King Cassiopeia was exceedingly beautiful, so all of the people marveled at her. She herself was proud of her dark eyes, her white, slender fingers, and her long black hair, so proud that she had heard to boast that she was even fairer than the sea nymphs who are the daughter of Nereus. At this, Nereus in wrath stirred up Poseidon, who came flooding in over the land, covering it far and wide. Not content with this, he sent a vast monster from the dark depths of the bottomless sea to ravage the whole coast of Ethiopia. When the unfortunate king and queen had sought the advice of the oracle on how to appease the god, they had been ordered to sacrifice their only daughter to, to the sea monster Poseidon had sent. Not daring for the people's sake to disobey, they had chained her to this rock where she now awaited the beast to devour her. Perseus confronted Andromeda as he stood by her on the rock, and she shrank closer against him with the great, with the great gray back with a half mile length slowly toward land. Then, bidding Andromeda hit her face, Perseus sprang once more into the air, unraveling the dreadful head of Medusa to the monster which reared its dropping jaws yards high into the air. The mighty tail stiffened all of a sudden, the boiling of the water ceased, and the gentle waves of the receding ocean lapped around a long gray ridge of stone. Then Perseus freed Andromeda and restored her to her father and beautiful mother. Thereafter, with consent, he married her, and amid the scene of treacherous, tremendous rejoicing, and with his bride, he set sail at last for the kingdom of Polydectus. Polydectus had lost no time in the departure of Perseus. First, he had begged Danae to, be, Danny, Danae, to become his wife, and then he th had threatened her. Undoubtedly, he would have gotten his way by force if Danny had not fled in terror to Dictus. The two took refuge at the altar of the temple where Polydectus did not dare drag them away. So matters stood when Perseus returned. Polydictus was a rage to see him, for he had hoped that at least that Danny's most powerful protector would never return. But now, seeing him famous with a king's daughter and as a wife, he could not contain himself. Openly, he laughed at the tale of Perseus, saying that the hero had never killed the Gorgon, only pretended to, and now claiming an honor he did not deserve. 
At this, Perseus, enraged by the insult and by the reports of his mother's persecution, said to him, you asked me.